So thank you everyone for joining us today. The focus of this side event is Iran and the freedom of religion or belief, um, especially as it concerns the midterm of this current university period of view. Um, as all of you may be aware, during the 36th session of the Human Rights Council last September, um, the delegation of the Islamic Republic of Iran circulated a hard copy of a report titled UPR Midterm Court 2015-2016. Um, which was prepared by the Judiciary of Iran's High Council for Human Rights. In the report, Iran offers a, an explanation of how it has implemented the accepted or partially accepted UPR recommendations that are received at the beginning of the UPR cycle. Um, and our two speakers today will share their remarks in light of these claims. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Ahmed Shahid, who needs no introduction as the Special Rapporteur on the freedom of religion or belief, a capacity in which he has been serving since November 2016. Um, and the participants will be also aware that prior to assuming this mandate, um, he was also the special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Iran from 2011 to 2016. Our second speaker is Ms. Dian Alai, a representative of the Baha'i International Community to the United Nations. So I'll hand it over to our speakers now. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I know time is limited, but before I start my comments, let me just recall um, the memory of um, Asma Jahangir, um, whose past is a great loss to all of us. He's a great personal friend to me, but also in the context of my, my current part of the UN, my previous role. Um, there is a president that turns into that fact that. Um, she took over my work on the year and I also am doing the work she had done remarkably well. Um, so it, she's very much uh, in my mind, certainly in our minds, as we have as we today. Uh, the situation in Iran continues to attract my attention, my current mandate as well. Um, I'm very concerned about what I see as a worsened situation with regard to respect for people within the country. The government perhaps has learned uh, from the past six, six, seven years to try to manage their PR a bit better, I think, but the reality remains that things have, have, have not improved. And nothing, I think, is more emblematic of the situation in the country than the plight of the Baha'is, the, the, the negative in, 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 in this sense, indicating how bad things are. Um, the UPR of, 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 of pledges made uh, by Iran as the previous cycle remained unfulfilled. Um, you know, the language is, is nice, but the actual fact remains that things have um, not have been implemented. So in reality, reality um, and in terms of my current report to the, U, uh, to the UN on my, on my mandate, um, there's very strong entanglement between religion and state. In Iran's case, creating a very clear hierarchy, or in other words, you know, formal discrimination with regard to uh, different uh, faith communities. And in the case of Baha'i, as we, as, we, as we all know, there is outright rejection of Baha'i as an identity, um, of, in, of even as persons that are recognized in law. And this has many, many impediments uh, for the fulfillment of the rights of the Baha'i community in the country. I have recounted this um, over several times, and, and they bear repeating. Um, and this, this, accords, uh, this includes things like I think es escalating violations of civil, political, economic, and social cultural rights. So one of the ways in which, in addition to um, you know, accusing Baha'i members of, of, of security, alleged security crimes, uh, uh, is the actual uh, systematic approach to destroy the community uh, as a community. So education remains a serious uh, impediment of, of, uh, for the community. A uh, access is blocked. In fact, those who try to then provide their own means of education are, are, are persecuted. Um, business the Baha'i business community can only f function if it doesn't go by that name. So uh, wherever they can identify a Baha'i business activity, uh, it is targeted. Um, and then, of course, you know, there are both direct and indirect forms uh, of, of, of harassment, persecution, um, that the authorities in, um, uh, enforce upon the, 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 Baha'i, the Baha'i community. In addition to that, there's of course um, um, what one, one call hate speech. It, it is quite quite normal to incite hatred 
um, against Baha'i community in public statements, in, public, uh, in other public expressions. Again, stigmatize the Baha'i community as um, a cult in a very pejorative sense in the in Iran's usage of, 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 of the town. But also equating, again, you know, um, Baha'i as outside. I mean, if you go back to the, uh, to, to the um, the, the, the motive of the folk devil comes to mind as to how the authorities in Iran try to actually paint uh, the, the Baha'i as a, 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 you know, a cause of um, threat uh, to the nation. And from this follows several uh, several other issues. Then, of course, if you look at the legal structure, um, it is a, gu a guidance to social hostilities because it clearly creates a hierarchy uh, um, of, of persons. And, uh, and Baha'i has no uh, redress to justice in many claims. In issues of, of, of say, personal, personal integrity violation, the Baha'is uh, cannot raise a claim in the case of, of murder by, 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 by a Muslim. And so, you know, the whole structure is, is, is actually created to really uh, uh, undermine the situation. I have described the situation of the Baha'i in Iran as intolerable. And, and, and this remains the case. And more than that, um, I could say there is disturbing. Not, I, I couldn't say evidence, but I think clearly uh, um, um, disturbing um, information that Iranians also threaten Baha'i who live outside the country as well. Uh, in, wherever they, they have some influence, they try to undermine their situation in other countries as well. And of course, you know, um, there has been for like um, rising influence of Iran in the region, and, and you can see a bit of that in the way the Baha'i in other countries are also, are also are affected. So it is a bigger than a, a, a problem for one, one community. It, it is, I think, um, it reflects the attitude of the state towards everybody in, in the country. It also spills beyond its borders to cover other countries. And I've had occasion to speak to other, other countries about the situation um, of the Baha'i in those countries, which we have, I think there is a pressure coming from, from Iran to address, um, or not address, to, to look at the Baha'i situation in those countries. So I shan't just go on and on. Uh, I just want to reiterate that the comments I make in my current report are very valid in the case of Iran. If you look at the plight of the Baha'is, you realize how valid these are because the state, uh, state uses religion as a way to enforce uh, the law. And therefore, because the Iranian understanding of Islamic law rejects Baha'i as, as, as persons, then therefore that is the uh, legal status of the Baha'i uh, in the country. And from this follows a, sy a systematic policy to actually destroy the community in the country. And we've seen this implemented uh, throughout. The most explicit version of this comes from 1990s with the memorandum which really showed a conspiracy, one could say, at the highest levels to destroy the Baha'i community in the country. And that has persisted, has been implemented in variety of forms uh, uh, throughout. Finally, I also want to, uh, given my current mandate, also want to uh, compliment the Baha'i community for their notion of the notion of constructive resilience, which I re referred to in my report to the GA in October, showing that even communities are, when a community is under stress, there are ways to respond in creative ways that don't mirror the, 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 the attitude of the persecution, persecution of the of the of the prosecutor here. Um, but uh, constructively reach out in different ways, enable the community to really be, be active, um, be also, um, in, in a sense, you know, uh, actualize their own potential through networking, um, through exploring all different venues, to, to become really a very, uh, uh, I could say, vibrant community. The Baha'i are remarkable for their presence uh, at the UN lobbies. They are remarkable for the work they do on behalf of their community in the country, outside the country, showing how networking, solidarity, and peaceful ways of being and knowing and acting really contributes to being a community even when they are under intense pressure uh, and harassment. So I should end there and be very happy to field any questions at the end. Thank you very much, Dr. Shahid. Um, maybe I'll, I'll pass it over to Diane first and then we can take some questions um, for you jointly. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Dr. Shahid, for the words that you have said and for your um, for your remarks. I would also want to join um, you in remembering Asma Jahangir, who has been a real um, a real defender of human rights of, uh, of people who have different religious minorities when they were. Uh, uh, when she was special reporter for freedom of religion and all Iranians 
when she was special reporter on Iran. So I think that really she was um, she she was a good friend, but she was also a great defender, and and, and her legacy will remain. I think really, um, and I'm, I'm I'm glad that we're able to remember her because I think her passion is quite a a shock for all of us. Um, as, as was mentioned earlier by my colleague, uh, what happened is that last, uh, last session in, in September, uh, during the Human Rights Council, actually it was a, a Glenn who was sitting in the room here, who pointed to me this document. Um, and this document uh, was just uh, distributed at the back of the, of the council in, in hard copy. And we started looking for electronic copies, but we couldn't find them, although it is from the High Council of Human Rights uh, uh, in Iran. And this is the UPR midterm report of Iran 2015-2016. So of course, with great interest, um, we tried to get a copy, and, and we looked through it. And I'm sure that uh, my colleagues who work more generally on Iran also will uh, have some comments to make about this midterm report. But Clearly, as a representative of the Baha'i International Community uh, and as interested in freedom of religion and belief, we went to uh, the part about um, performing, performance of programming areas in the media regarding ethnic and religious minorities. So we went into the, the uh, religious minorities. There were a few paragraphs. You know that in Iran, the system is that, as Dr. Jaid mentioned, it, there is a hierarchy in rights. So the religion, uh, the state religion <coughs> of the country is Islam, but Islam of the Shia uh, 12th uh, Imam branch. So it's that particular Islam, which is the state religion. And then there are three religious minorities, which are the Christians, the Jews, and the Zoroastrians. So basically, the Baha'is are not recognized as a religious minority. So that report had a, a little section on how well um, religious minorities, recognized religious minorities are doing. Um, we do know that they're not doing well. We do know that there is also, and I'm sure that Dr. Shahid can talk about that, that also discrimination for Sunnis, there's discrimination for even Shias like the, the Gonabadi dervishes. There is discrimination for the Zoroastrians. We know that there was a, <coughs> a gentleman who was not allowed to, to be, although he was elected, he was not allowed to be on the council um, on the uh, local council in one city because he was a Russian, etc. So we do know that even religious minorities don't have rights, but then there was also a, a, another section which was called sects, the, the right, which is actually the term that yeah. you, you refer to, which is of course negative, and that is only about the, the Baha'is. And what is interesting is that actually this, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this UPR midterm report sets the rights that Baha'is have. So, and there's so few, I mean, it's very small. Huh? I think if we, if we look at the, it's page 31. So if we look at it, it's really, um, one, two, eight, sorry. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's this, right? So it's this, 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 this thing. Um, so you see that there are not many rights. So if we think that the Baha'is only have these rights really because they don't have any other rights, if, 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 it's, if that's the only rights that are listed, um, there are not many. There are four legal rights, a few economic rights, and a few um, social and cultural rights. But on top of it, um, it's not truthful because even the few rights that are actually indicated as rights that are given to Baha'is, let alone the rights that are not given to Baha'is because they're not indicated here, the Islamic Republic is not truthful about it. Um, for example, it talks about the fact that um, uh, Baha'is can have properties. We know how many confiscation of properties there are. It's said that Baha'is have work permit issuance. We know how many work permits are actually revoked because people are Baha'is. Um, Agricultural services, we know that agricultural land has been um, uh, confiscated for Baha'is. Um, and really, I mean, when they come to such details as owning tractors and agricult agricultural equipment, and that is one of the few rights that are given to Baha'is, you imagine the scope. And it also shows the thinking that really this is, as you, as you said, Dr. Shane, Baha'is are should not be given rights. And this is something that, in fact, has been said to some Baha'is. 
um, during interrogations, you know, telling them that you, know, you should be lucky that we actually allow you to breathe the air of the country, although they are citizens. And then you have Mr. Rouhani, the president of the Islamic Republic, who says that now he has created this wonderful citizenship charter, which you will hear a number of the, um, of the uh, diplomats here, uh, either in Geneva or in New York, referring to it, and saying that there is the citizenship charter, and that therefore now there is right for everyone. But clearly, the Baha'is are not considered citizens because clearly the, these rights that are in this charter um, are not included to them. Then, for social and cultural rights, sometimes there's even an incredible irony, which if I think we were not resilient, uh, as you mentioned, we would be extremely um, hurt by what it says, because it says that Baha'is have private cemeteries. Often Baha'is are not even allowed to bury their dead. And if they're given so-called private cemeteries, it's actually wasteland outside of the city because they would not be allowed to use the normal cemetery. So they give them wastelands and they say, okay, use that. And they, and they, and they dare to call that private cemetery in, the, in, the, in their report, which is just um, a, li a little bit ironical to say the least. Um, so, the, this is the review of the, of the, the, I mean, the answer that the government of the Islamic Republic has given to this, this, um, this persecution of the Baha'is. Although, in all respects, and the Baha'i International Committee has produced a document that is available on our website if you're interested to see it, which actually looks at all the UPR recommendations that were made to Iran and that Iran has accepted or partially accepted and that deal that could deal with the situation of the Baha'is and how they're not uh, accepting them. For example, uh, Iran has accepted two recommendations, one from Burkina Faso and one from uh, Macedonia about unlawful arrest and arbitrary detention. <coughs> At the moment, there are nearly 80 Baha'is who are in prison simply because they're Baha'is for no other reason. And some of them have very long sentences um, that could go up to 10 years imprisonment. And some of them are above the age of 80 and have to suffer this long-term imprisonment. Some of them, while they're in prison, they're not allowed even to go and to the funeral of their wives when their wives passed away. Some of them are not allowed to go and visit their children when their children have, are, where their ba babies or their grandchildren are born, um, which are things that are given, uh, allowances that are pro provided in the Iranian, uh, Iranian law. Then there is um, recommendations that Iran has accepted or partially accepted in the UPR concerning the violation of due process and norms of the judicial system. For example, a recommendation, two recommendations made by France for the independence of the judiciary, a recommendation made by the UK, and a recommendation made by Germany, um, and another recommendation made by Norway. Um, we know that in Iran, as uh, Dr. Shahid mentioned, um, because, and I think it will be the subject of one of your reports, because the, 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 there are these security um, the, the threats that are seen. Um, so the, the Baha'is are actually treated by the revolutionary courts. And the revolutionary courts are generally um, told to, uh, by the Ministry of Information, by the secret services, as to how they, they, what kind of accusations they should give. There is no evidence. Um, uh, Mrs. Shirin Ebadi, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, who was one of the lawyers of the seven Baha'i uh, uh, lead members of the Baha'i leadership in Iran? Um, she said herself that she went through the whole file of these um, individuals who were actually condemned to death originally, and then their sentence was reduced to 10 years imprisonment. Um, she said that there was not one shred of evidence. So I think that, and also the, the trial was, of course, uh, not public. 
So um, uh, we see that there is absolutely no due process, um, uh, despite the fact that Iran had agreed to um, uh, uh, respect these uh, recommendations from the UPR. Um, another uh, another uh, of the recommendations are the right to education. I think Chile uh, made a recommendation on the right to education, and also the D uh, also the DPRK actually made also a recommendation that was accepted by Iran. Um, and these two recommendations, we know that Baha'is are not allowed, Baha'i youth are not allowed to go to university, um, and if they're not identified as Baha'is during the registration process, so they enter university, as soon as they're identified as Baha'is, they're expelled. And this is part of the, the, the document that you mentioned, the 1991 document, uh, that was actually uh, discovered by Mr. Renaldo Galindo Paul, who was at the time the special reporter on Iran, and that I, says that the Baha'is should not be allowed to go to have access to education. And this continues still on today, despite the claims by the Iranian government that this is not true, particularly by actually Mr. Lari Jani himself during the UPR, um, who is the head of this high, the Secretary General of this High Council for Human Rights. Um, and then there is um, a more general uh, uh, recommendations, for example, one from Romania, ensure freedom of religion and belief for all citizens of Iran, which Iran has also accepted. And then there is the um, incitement to hatred, as was also uh, referred to by uh, Dr. Shahid. There are uh, um, a couple of recommendations, one made by Armenia and one made by Lebanon. Um, and Iran has been using all the media that it has at its hands. Um, TV programs, document, fake documentaries, um, websites, radio, preachers also from the, from the clerics to incite hatred against the Baha'is. Here I have to say that the Baha'is are really not the only ones who are subject to this great attention by the Iranian media. I think that there are other religious minorities who also face the same, the same problem. And actually, it's very similar, similar the same rhetoric uh, against the Baha'is. But it's really incitement to hatred. But you also know that, in fact, this incitement to hatred, because the Iranian law is discriminatory, um, allows anyone to kill Baha'i without being punished. Because I Iran has a system by which um, it's the, um, uh, the law of retribution. So, the, the, you know, if you kill, you're killed. But it's only if you kill a Muslim that you're killed. If you kill a Baha'i because your blood money is not as much, so therefore you're not going to be killed. Um, and so there, there is, in one case, we had um, a gentleman who was um, killed by two brothers in the city of Yaz. And uh, uh, the court, who actually wanted to condemn them, but could not, had to find like uh, creating public disorder to be able to condemn them to a few years imprisonment because they could not actually be uh, uh, convicted as criminals because the person that they had murdered was a Baha'i and therefore there was no provision in the law um, for, 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 that, for that murder. So imagine if you, have an ins if, you, if you have the whole media, which is a state media, you know, it's a state controlled media, it's quite different than, than perhaps um, in other countries. Imagine if you have the whole state media that incites to hatred and then you're not really punished for, the, for any crime that you commit against the Baha'i what the situation could be. It could be far worse, actually, than what we see today. Um, there are, um, uh, finally, I, I wanted to say just a few words also, uh, and thank very much um, uh, Dr. Shahid for the, the, the words that he said about the Baha'i community, because the Baha'i community is really not a community that um, um, has decided to uh, either be violent in the same way that its oppressors are, so it didn't want to take all the wrong, the negative attributes of the oppressors. But it also didn't want to <coughs> completely bow down to submissiveness. And so it has decided to really start to contribute, try to contribute shoulder to shoulder to the well-being of, of, of Iran, and still wants to do that. And I think that this is the only claim that the Baha'is <coughs> want, is to be just 
citizens, like any other Iranian citizens, not to have privileges, as is in a way indicated in this UPR report. Those privileges are very little um, and non-existent. In fact, the ones that are mentioned are little, but the real privileges are, don't exist at all. But the Baha'is don't want to any privilege of any kind. They just want to be allowed, as any other Iranian citizen, to be able to contribute to the well-being of their own country that they love. And that's why they decided to stay there. So I think that this is, uh, it should, they should not be seen as a community. They are a persecuted community, but they are not a disempowered community. Um, and I'll stop here, and maybe we can have questions for the special report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, after this short report. Uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Pervis. I'm actually come from Norway as a member of the International Law Association of Norwegian Branch. But I am also doing the Iranian as a diplomat in Scandinavia. And I met you also in Oslo. I want to relate the two sad business with my compatriots or my compatriots behind us. The one is the fatwa of harmony. It is a clear fatwa. I just came this later to this session, I maybe mentioned it. He specifically said that there are dirty people and they should not be touched. And then uh, the thing which is uh, is it in their hand, which is, it, when it is wet and not dry even. So it's not, it is not touchable, this people. So this is, this people, this is something go beyond even the, <coughs> the Nazi Germany. And and living the history. By my business as a diplomat uh, after the revolution, because I was also in the revolution before also uh, I was a diplomat, but, you know, I was the acting ambassador in Sweden and Norway. And it, there was a circular coming about the Bacchus. And I think we can find it one day in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The speech speech the speech say that don't uh, renew the passport of Bacchus don't give them the new passports. Because those days in the beginning of the revolution, there was no uh, uh, asylum for the Iranians because they thought it was the democracy. So the only way to force Baha'i is to go back to Iran and sign that affidavit and put it in the newspaper of the country and say that I was a Baha'i, so I relinquish uh, my faith and I become a Muslim, otherwise they, they have been executed. Mm -hmm. So what I did before I uh, Effected my embassy, I called the Baha'i community. I had a very good uh, connection with them. And I have a speedy letter that they thank you for it, but I didn't do nothing. It was my duty. So I, uh, before I just defected my embassy openly in 1982, I have renewed their passport for 10 years, 15 years, so that they won't be sent back to Iran because we didn't have this this asylum system at the time of Iran. That is my business, and I wish them all the best. This is very painful, really. I, 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 the, the history bleeding because of Baha'is and the other community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I mean, um, uh, yes, I, I recall meeting you uh, when I was doing my work as the reporter of Iran. What you say with regard to what happened then, you know, the, 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 the circular to prevent <coughs> Baha'i from saying all season for them to come back, um, is in some ways happening today also trying to evict them from a place of, of safety, what one could say, through, through, through various means. And also, uh, we haven't said this, but I'm sure everybody is here familiar that um, there were actually mass killings of Baha'i uh, all the time that you, that you refer to done by the state at the state's command. So it's not simply a question of an abstract written paper and a general system of prosecution, but one that actually involved actual ma 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 uh, mass killing. Um, this one is something to add from my current work. When I was doing my present report, I checked the amount, the volume of communications that have been sent by the mandate, my producers and others, um, uh, on issues of religious freedom. So what we have, on, uh, available online goes back some 17 years, and I looked at the total number, it was 660. 
and the highest recipient, ha target country of these communications, surprise, surprise, is Iran, uh, indicating you know, that there's been continuous and very serious concerns about what's happened in the country. This is about 10% of all communications sent by the mandate that, that I now hold. So given the scale of problems the mandate faces on, on this subject around the world, you know, 193 states and almost every country have problems, to be the recipient of 10% of those communications says a lot. Of course, the, the, sec the second nearest country is China. If you look at the population size, you can see, you know, because our communications are very much based upon individual victims and how to address the situation. So if there is a, you know, a large population, then you probably have a large number of people you have to, to address. But to be the recipient of the highest and 10% of all communications actually says we have a very serious problem that, that we are dealing with. Are there any other questions? Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, organizing this panel. But looking for regarding what uh, Dr. Shank said and uh, Diane, something for me is very, very, uh, is not very easy to, to understand to get that regarding the education. For me, as a researcher in the university, the education is a key for the, for the well-being of all the society. In this situation, looking to Baha'i, they, they are missing the right to go to university. It's a crime. Because for the last time, or large uh, uh, epochs, you can say, the future of this community, not only discrimination or equality today, but looking for the future, they are collapsing. That is uh, probably we can see that is is equal with the with the with the genocide in one's one sign if we say that we cannot accept that. I was looking today the report of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, uh, present. He said the Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights continue to be a global voice for equality and non discrimination and all human rights for all. In this situation, my question is. What can we do? What is doing practically the, uh, the United Nations? What can we do together? Because all of us, we are responsible to do this something, to help this minority. The second is the, the citizenship. I'm happy because I'm a European citizen. Thanks for the European Union. Because we, are, we have set very good rules here in Europe. We can give to others. To import, uh, they can take, uh, to look to our, our rules, what we live here. We are happy for that. But we are looking to others, not only to my rights. If for that probably we need to think to propose a resolution of all the United Nations missions in this issue. The Baha'i to be recognized as, as, a, as a minority, to have the, the same rights as other citizens from their country, because what I could see myself looking to different friends which I have, Baha'i from other minorities, they are peaceful people. And we need to help them. We need to put in their shoes. Because if I'm looking to my kids, if they don't have right to go into school, in the university, to be prepared for the future, what happened for them? For that, is my opinion that we need to work together. We need to, to, uh, to speak up for their rights. Because the education is a key for our, our present, but for our future. Not only for Iran, we respect each government. For us, is normal. I, 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 I can say in the name of my organization, yeah, I feel that. I recognize, I respect, but I don't, I'm not agree, I cannot accept this inequality, this situation. For education, we need to fight. Because it's a future, we can open doors for the society where they are living. That is the best. It's my proposal. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, we can take another question, please. Thank you very much, uh, Caitlin Fisher from the Permanent Mission of Canada, and, and thank you very much to Dr. Shaheen and to Diana as well, to you both for, for your efforts here, not just in this room today, but also more broadly on this issue. Um, I'll say, you know, from a Canadian perspective, it's extremely frustrating for us, and, and I think that's a bit of an understatement, quite frankly. 
But in the many, many years that I've, I've been working on, on this issue, and issues surrounding freedom of religion and belief, um, the situation for the Baha'i does not seem to have improved at all. Um, and it's incredibly troubling the fact that year over year, in report after report, we continue to see these types of challenges for the Baha'i community. Um, Deanna, I really appreciated your comment, though, that the Baha'i are persecuted, but not just empowered a group of people. I think that's an excellent way of summarizing this. And, and I think the voices that you bring to the UN here and also around the world have also done a lot to kind of raise awareness about that issue. Um, and similarly for, for you, Dr. Shadi, the work that you've done in your previous position, but also in your current position. Um, I wanted to maybe echo and, and uh, provide a little more precision on, on one of the questions that uh, the previous speaker had raised, just with respect to the issue of what is it that we can do and what is it that actually works? Um, you had mentioned you know, that, that there are 10% of the communications you said that are sent in the current mandate are sent to Iran. Do you find that those communications are, are helpful? I realize that those aren't a, a public way of you know, raising awareness about the issue, but often bilateral discussions can provide you know, considerable resolution to some of these issues. So what are the tools that you have found to be the most effective for addressing this issue, and what are the ways that the international community can help support some of those tools to try to resolve the situation. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. It's a very, very good question that we should accept our minds on at the present time. I was actually, before you took the floor, I was going to say in response to the question asked, uh, asked uh, that, you know, if you look at what happens now, the main point of pressure of the government of Iran now comes, I know, the, at the GA, debate resolution in, in New York. And I was going to compliment Canada for having run that resolution now a dozen years or more. And that, yeah, so that is the sort of you know, the key point. That has the space for putting on a lot of the issues of concern that, that we have, and also drawing global attention to the issue and have a, a large number of countries, increasing number of countries subscribe to the, uh, you know, cons the echo the concerns that, that, that are there. Do these uh, communications and concerns make a difference? Yes. They do. Um, uh, in almost every case uh, that I was a communication in Iran when I was a mandate holder, there was something the government did. It was never enough, but it almost always uh, had some positive, even temporary uh, action on, on, on their part. Although um, there were tragically one or two cases in which um, they did the reverse of what was asked of them to do. But I think that was because of the very peculiar nature of the situation. This, is, this one case involved the death of um, a Revolutionary Guard member, to which, of course, there is no plea that you can make, uh, given, the, given the status they are given in the country. But in almost every other case, I found there was some positive uh, movement. But this, the kind of movement corresponded to the, what, how sustained that exposure of the country was. So when, when, you, when you put sustained pressure on the country, there is some movement. It is never sufficient. It doesn't really resolve issues. But I think certainly the part of those who are the alleged victims, they certainly have a psychological benefit from being recognized and being spoken of. That's one. But beyond that, there is some even material, um, I think, improvement that does take place on occasion, or well, quite frequently, but to, for a limited uh, space. But we need to go beyond, beyond this. At the end of the last UPR, Iranian, um, the chairman of the High Council, it's always High Council for, for, for Human, human Rights, um, said that, look at the room, 70% liked us, 30% didn't. So it is this kind of, you know, no, uh, counting numbers, um, that kind of, you know, <laughs> they, 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 they cite. So I think we need to increase uh, the, the kind of voices uh, that speak out on, on these issues. And, and this becomes difficult because I think over the years, government of Iran has invested more and more on counter diplomacy to, to, to say your efforts and our, our efforts. The, the midterm review report comes, in, in my time I was asking them that they should subject themselves to the standard here in UN for a midterm. And they of course rejected it in, in, in those f first cycle, but for the end of their first cycle they came with bigger books than this to dis dis distribute hard copies uh, in, in the southern China elsewhere. And then for this time around they've done their own midterm review. So they're playing the game. Um, which is frustrating, but also in this there is the understanding that all these things matter. Mm -hmm. That being spoken about matters to them. And what really matters to them most is when it is spoken to, spoken about in Persian. Right? When it's spoken in a language people in the country know, when the people in, in, in parts of Iran know that their government has this rhetoric, reality is here, and people aren't 
sort of you know for them for, for that. So being able to reach out into the country, uh, being able to reach out to the Iranian people and speak to them is vital. And there is opportunity here because Iranians are among the sort of most educated, most aware, most technologically linked people that you might find any kind of sort of you know um, country in that part of the world. And therefore there are opportunities for using that. So I would I would recommend uh, more mobilization of civil society in the country through through digital means because other means <laughs> uh, will have a risk attached to it. Then talking to more delegations uh, in uh, Geneva and New York about what's really is happening in the country, documenting uh, what's the violations, making sure that the stories we have actually have faces uh, to it as well. But also being mindful of some, some things we try to do to improve can also have negative impacts. Now, uh, I don't know what my colleagues will say if I said this in this forum here, but my colleagues recently decided that nobody's name will mention in a UN report unless the person consented to it. I think the, the concern they had was that there should be consent. But in the Iran case, we are doing quite a bad thing here because now the government will say, your name is there because you called them and said yes. And in my time, I could say, well, they may not know about this. I have offended by so I'm talking about this. So the deniability that somebody may have had earlier is not gone. So I mean, we have to be very mindful that how, when we address these com complex structures of you know, diplomacy of human rights, that we are aware of the counter uh, arguments here as well. So, to conclude all this, I think uh, what's really important is documentation of accurate reliable information, having that brought out to Geneva and New York, and then taking it back to the people in ways the government is exposed for their uh, uh, wrongdoings. Thank you. I'll, I'll just um, make a, a few comments. Thank you both for your comments, and of course, thank, thank Canada for. Um, for really the, the importance that it's giving to human rights situation in Iran. I think we're also extremely grateful of the, of the way that Canada is uh, presenting the, the, the resolution at the General Assembly um, year after year, and also working for its successful adoption. Um, because I think also that Iran is extremely susceptible to public pressure. Um, I think that they wouldn't spend so much time, effort, and money to produce this publication um, if it wasn't because they think that they have to show their good image and so they want their good name to be um, to be there. So the more there are individuals, organizations, governments of course, who raise the situation with them and particularly the situation of the Baha'is. I have to say that you know we've heard from a number of um, uh, uh, diplomats who have gone to Iran and they have said that we can raise any issue in discussions with the Iranian government, even death penalty, you know, even um, sexual orientation. But as soon as we pronounce the word Baha'i, the conversation is ended. So I think that we have to realize that therefore, if we want to make an impact, that word should be mentioned also, and we shouldn't shy away from it. Um, to just go back to the denial of education, you know, um, uh, it's been now sometimes for three generations that Baha'is have not been allowed to have, to, to have access to universities. And sometimes it is very, very heartbreaking for these young people because in Iran the system for access to university is actually a, a ranking exam. So you know the higher ranking you are, the better university you can go to or the more choice you have of what subject you can study. So after the pressure that has been put actually here um, through uh, a number of um, efforts, but particularly an effort at the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the form, so, so that proves completely that you know, pressure works. Because the original form for even registering for that exam had columns for the four religious minority, I mean four religion, the religion, state religion and the three religion minorities, and there was no other option. Whereas after that pressure, the form now no longer has any entry for your religion. So the Baha'i youth who were deprived from passing those exams have now been allowed to pass those exams. And some of them are ranking really, really high. Some of them have remarkable numbers. And yet after, when they want to register, they say your file is incomplete. So you cannot register. And of course, everybody knows when they go and follow, and it's evident that finally the file, the incompleteness of the file is just because they're behind. That's why it's incomplete. 
I have to say again, just a, a, one word though, is that um, Baha'is have found a system through online education to be able to educate uh, their youth. And so uh, youth are gathering in people's living rooms, in kitchens that they use as laboratories, and they study through university professors who are outside Iran, and through internet, give them courses. So there is a system, it's a very grassroots system, if you imagine a you know, chemistry lab in the kitchen, but it is a, but it is a, but it is a system that works, and, and there are many universities outside of Iran who now accept the, the bachelor's degree from that Baha'i Institute of Higher Education. Still, and, uh, and then I, I, I just, there's one thing that perhaps I forgot, is that the killing that uh, Dr. Shahid referred to um, uh, of the Baha'is has now, uh, you know, Stopped, except for those uh, killings that I said that are done by plain clothes or non-state actors, but the official killings of Baha'is have stopped. But there is economic suffocation because Baha'is are just not allowed to study and they're not allowed to work. So if you're not allowed to study and you're not allowed to have a profession, you know, of course I'm not physically killing you, but at the end of the day, I am completely not allowing you to be a full participant in in in, in the in 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 the life of society and, and to be really ostracized. So this is also something that I wanted to add, aside from the denial of access to education. Are there any more questions? Please. I just want to make one uh, additional thing about the government of Canada. And uh, as uh, a person of the Iranian, I want to express my gratitude to the Canadian government and delegation of the United Nations. And the year, many, many times they think the question of Iran and they sponsor these resolutions. Just want to thank the Canadian government. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't know if you wanted to offer any concluding remarks, or please. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank everybody in the room uh, for all the interest they've expressed in Humanity Iran over the years, and also uh, when I was a match holder for cooperating with me in the work I, I was doing. I again want to reassert the importance of how of us, all of us working together. There are some, some areas where we still can't do it all that well. I shall end by making just one observation about that. Um, one is that the UN is a, f a family of many, many different creatures. And some of these, some, some parts are very human rights friendly, other parts are not so human rights friendly. And, and sometimes there is no coordination in the way it operates. One good example um, is, uh, without actually meaning to put anybody in the spot here, the UN country team in, in, in Tehran. Um, I'm, referring, I'm not referring to the present time, but over the six years I was in the man. I really struggled to, to, to really give meaning to the Secretary General's phrase, one UN, it really wasn't one, it was multiple events, and the notion that human rights first, the notion that human rights would be everywhere, didn't really go very far. So the UN has something called the, uh, the common, uh, the development agencies framework, whereby all the uh, UN different agencies come together and sign a common program, three years or five years in some, of, uh, some occasions, whereby they agree on what they will do. And of course, some of these uh, elements are vital for Iran uh, because you know, this brings in the, the money. On other, on other occasions, this is linked to programs they really need help, help in, such as the work of the UNODC, the Office for Drugs and, and Crime. So they do a lot of work with the authorities of Iran in training them to combat drug trafficking in, in the country. And certainly, the symbolic value of having a UN operation there is so vital for, for, for the country. But I think that the potential of this team is underexplored in terms of promoting human rights. Fifteen years ago, it was possible for the UNDAF to say human rights is part of their work. Not since. Uh, this has not featured in this. And I think uh, we can all sort of put our heads together and put more, more pressure or add our voice. Uh, to, the, to the people in New York at the headquarters to make sure that WHO, UNICEF, that they all actually put human rights uh, in what they do. 
So you cannot be doing a UNICEF program in the country if the Baha'i are not part of the beneficiaries of this program. You can't have WHO dispense any activity there if the Baha'i are not part of that. So the human rights based approach means everybody is a beneficiary. So I think we really have to insist on these principles as we go along. I really have to go to another event, so I thank you so, uh, uh, so, so much for the uh, occasion to be here and talk to you. It's really a great pleasure to see my Iranian friends and, and to be with you talk about your great country. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues, for being here. We have also a number of publications in the back if you're interested in, in, in them. And thank you again uh, very much, dear Dr. Shahid, for your work on Iran and on freedom of religion or belief. Thank you.